Well, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for coming to tonight's lecture. I'm Peter Kern, Director of the Global Public Health Program, and uh, this lecture series is sponsored by two organizations, the External Advisory Committee for the Global Public Health Program and the Institute for Health and Humanities. And we also are very grateful for the Missoula Community Access Television for their willingness to film uh, the uh, lectures that we have in this lecture series and then those the link to those lectures go on our, our global public health webpage so that you can <coughs> revisit the lecture or uh, tell your friends who weren't able to come tonight uh, that they can you know, get access to that through that vehicle so let me introduce lee taggart lee has a bs in nutrition from the <laughs> university of vermont a bsn in nursing from westminster college of salt lake city and in 2012, she received a Master's of Public Health from the University of Montana. She has worked as a critical care nurse for nearly 25 years. Since 2008, she has been working in rural Uganda on a public health project that focuses on post-war recovery and empowerment for families, and specifically women displaced by the war in northern Uganda. In 2012, she joined the Atlas Cultural Foundation, where she serves as the Public Health Program Coordinator. The Atlas Cultural Foundation's mission is, and I'm quoting, to collaborate with rural Moroccans to improve their quality of life in the fields of cultural preservation, community education, and public health. Along with her current nursing work in acute care, Ms. Taggart provides a service learning experience to, for Morocco, to Morocco for students of nursing and public health each year through Montana State University in Billings. She lives in British Columbia, uh, and we thank her for coming all the way here for this lecture tonight. I'd just like to add one other thing. Um, Lee is, believe it or not, and this was not planned ahead of time, just happened. She is the third student of mine to give a lecture in this lecture series. Uh, and I would also like to mention that all three of them got an A in the class. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you. I, I, I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed that class, too. It was the highlight of, one of the highlights of my public health degree here at the University of Montana. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me. And um, we're going to take a little trip to northern Africa today, tonight. Um, like Peter said, I have been working um, with the organization called the Atlas Cultural Foundation since um, 2011. Um, it's sort of a small world story, but um, when I was traveling to Uganda for my work in Uganda, my girlfriend Chloe Erickson, who was living in Livingston at the time, was traveling to Yemen and Morocco and um, other northern Africa, Tunisia. And we would come back together in Livingston and f having had these crazy world experiences, and we would say, nobody else understands what we're going through. And we would have major culture shock. And that's how we formed our bond. And Chloe is the one who started the Atlas Cultural Foundation. She and her husband, Christopher Erickson, is a, he's a North Face climber. And they had gone to Morocco to, on their honeymoon, actually, to go rock climbing and fell in love with the country. And that was in 2000 six I think or 2005 and after that time Chloe and Chris both decided that this was a place that they their hearts were just in love with and they needed to stay and then in 2012 I became involved um, at, because I had been running the health programs in Uganda and and Chloe realized that it was more than just um, I'll explain, but she does, um, she's an architect by trade, and so they were restoring ancient granaries in the area, and she realized that she loved the area and that there was more to the, the, than just restoring the granaries. She wanted to become involved in the community and um, 
and she actually lives there now half the time. So um, there, we have some objectives. There won't be a quiz. Somebody was worried about a quiz. <laughs> There's no quizzes here. Um, but I did the objectives, I want to just cover the work that we do, um, the Atlas Cultural Foundation. Um, and, and in, when I was doing my master's, um, and when I, when I was working in Uganda, we developed a model called, an, it's a model that I created um, based on some of the work that I had been doing, and it's called the PRESM model, and I'll go over that. Um, the other thing I wanted to spend a little bit of time tonight talking about is this idea of sustainability, because I came up with a topic, the title, the um, sustainable communities, and then I was like, oh, well, sustainability, that's a pretty big word. What does it mean? And what are we doing to help uh, be sustainable and while providing a sustainable community? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then the other thing I want to share is the work that we're doing, working with students and universities, and now we're working um, with Moroccan schools and Moroccan universities to build a bigger world and share Morocco and Montana and Canada as well um, because there's so many similarities. Um, they're so different, but there's so many similarities, especially when it comes to healthcare delivery, to um, climate change and some of the issues we're dealing with with climate change. And so I feel like that's a really neat connection that needs to be not forgotten. And if anybody has questions, just jump out. I, please don't hesitate to ask if you have a question. So as Peter said, the, uh, the uh, mission of the Atlas Cultural Foundation is to collaborate with rural Moroccans to improve their quality of life in the field of cultural preservation, community education, excuse me, community education and public health. Um, working in Morocco is, a ch it's challenging. Um, it, the, in order to be uh, a legal nonprofit working in Morocco, you have to partner with a legal local organization. And there are many people out there, many uh, Moroccans that will say, yes, come and work in my village or come and work with me. But if they're not a legal organization or an association, you can get in big trouble. And you can get in such big trouble that you are never, you're asked to never come back to Morocco again. And so that is something that we're very proud of. Um, that we have affiliated, aligned our, ourselves with um, an organization called SMIDI, S-M-N-I-D, and SMIDI um, means moving forward in Berber. And so um, between, so ACF and, and SMIDI have had a partnership since 2009, and everything goes through the local association. Um, so that nothing, and every, every question we ask in our health awareness days, every project that we do has to go through the association and it has to go through the government basically. So, so where is it? You can see on the map, I don't have a pointer. We're in a region called Zawiya Ahansal and I, Talked to one gentleman that kind of knew where Zawiya, he knew where Ozzy Lal is. Has, have any of you guys been to Morocco? Okay, excellent. Yeah, Haley. <laughs> Haley was on our trip last year. Um, so this Marrakesh, um, and then we're pretty much due west of, due east of Marrakesh, up into the high, excuse me, the high Atlas Mountains. Um, it's a region that um, strategically placed in North Africa. There's 34 million people in the country of Morocco. Um, the primary language is Arabic, Berber, and French. Um, and Morocco is interesting. Um, it considers itself a parliamentary constitutional monarchy, which I'm not a government person, um, but I have, Morocco is quite amazing in its response 
in the last 10 years to serving the needs of the people. And while nothing, nobody's perfect and there's a lot of issues with a lot of governments, I have to say I've been very impressed with the way the king has strategically you know, done some actions that have kept his, kept the people fairly peaceful, fairly content. And even in the short amount of time that I've been going to Zawiya Ahansal, it is amazing how much infrastructure and how much has been given to the, this part of, the, how much energy they're putting into the rural parts of Morocco. And that helps keep the people happy. And when you keep the people happy and they feel part of a whole system, that helps prevent other things from happening, which we've seen in other parts of Northern Africa. I think of the Arab Spring and what happened. And Morocco um, was very assertive in their, you know, in their actions shortly after the, after the Arab Spring to help not have an Arab Spring in Morocco. So this is the, um, the village, the, one of the main villages. There's four main villages in Zawiya Ahansal. It's about 15,000 people. Um, it's a region that's cut by the, through, by the Ahansal River, which is just in a beautiful river. It um, provides sustenance, water for the agriculture. For it's, if, if it ever were to can be contaminated or dry up, it would be a devastating thing for this region. And I'll get into a little story about that. Um, but you can see the villages are very compact and tight. Um, and then there's also the nomads that come up from the desert. And you'll see them come through in the spring. They have their camels. And they account for a fair number of people that are um, in the region, especially in, in the summer months and then they go back down to the desert in the winter. When I, the, it, it, the, it, we say it's the second poorest region of Morocco, um, that, they, that it's probably changed in the last five years. Um, we don't have new statistics, but um, our, the students from this region are doing amazingly well these days on their test scores and getting into universities and going on to advanced education which is, I don't think, all just us. <laughs> but I think it has to do with some of the infrastructure and, and some of the opportunities that have been provided for these students in the last 10 years. So do they not do anything with adult literacy? Does the government not have adult? For adult literacy? In our region, uh, the government doesn't do anything for adult literacy, but they but our organization does. We have a women's empowerment group, and they, we have an English language program, and the women are, and, and other men and kids, and I'll get into that a little bit. I don't know, do you know, Shelley? Do they have any adult literacy programs that are government sponsored? Yeah. Good question, though. We can. So this is the model that, I, that my friend and I, um, I work for another organization called Hope to One Life. They're based out of Billings. And this is the model that we created. And the whole idea is that um, we work with a holistic approach. And, that, and, and, and I was working with refugees. I still work with them. And it's a di little bit different scenario. But at the same time, I feel like um, in order to ha bring a person to a full potential, um, and a community to full potential, while it seems idealistic to address all these things simultaneously, we can't forget each of these elements. Because if you have health care and you have water and you have a place to live, but your people feel hopeless and helpless, that's not sustainability. That's not community wholeness. So our goal is to address each of these components 
simultaneously. Some, and it goes in waves. <laughs> um, pre, post war, so po or I would say post disaster, or you could say post anything, or pre. I mean. Yeah, it, I've, we've, we've morphed it a little bit for Morocco because they're, they're just, they're be, it's an empowerment model. Um, it, the work I do in Uganda, it's clearly post-war and post, uh, it, it was the post-war is what it, how I started post -colonial. it. Post-colonial. Post-colonial, thank you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, colonialism. Just want to make sure. So well, the first component is the shelter and settlement. And um, the houses where the Moroccans live are these up in the mountains are these beautiful stone buildings, most of them. They're incredibly old. They're all handmade. Um, the workmanship that goes into them is unbelievable. Um, but ag and again, what when I, as a public with a public health eye, um, our goal with the settlement and, and the housing piece is, is, is it safe? Is it um, free of diseases? You know, is it potential, you know, is there a potential for diseases? And I'll get into our list. Sort of what, uh, what we do is we work individually with families as well as with the community and and I have, we've developed a list of the, what I call the individual household assessment. And as I'm walking through a village or walking through a compound, these are some of the things that I'm looking at because these are some of the things that can really make the difference between being healthy and being sick. If your animals are living where your children play and the animal poops, and the kid is playing in the poop, and then the kid goes, picks up, gets picked up by mom, and then nobody's washing their hands, and then all of a sudden everybody has diarrhea, right? And that's, it, it's very, seems very simple, but it, this is the, you know, it, it happens. And so our goal is to do education, um, and to do workshops, and to um, very, uh, with very much respect, and with um, honor to discuss these findings or, you know, things that we say, well, you know, if we keep the animals out then and, and keep them separate, then the children have a s safe place to play. Um, then and nobody is walking in the poop and nobody's getting diarrhea. So, th so these are the, some of the things that we, that we focus on when, when I talk about settlement and household is, is those that individual things that, because really change happens with individuals too. You know, we, we want to see it from a community level, but it's the individual level too. So. Do they accept it? Like are they willing mm. to make the changes or is it difficult for them? Oh, change is difficult. Right. So what do they say, 17 years to go from research to practice? So I feel that is, um, and, and I, I can't stress enough, our role is not to be punitive in any work that we do. It's not to criticize. It is, you know, this is the reality. Um, and this is why every year we repeat the same topics. We add new topics, but every year and every session, we repeat the basic learnings, whether it's washing your hands, having a safe place to dry your utensils, um, using Clorox a little bit. I mean, every year we have to go over the Clorox thing because somebody's adding like two cups of Clorox to their you know, cleaning. And, and, and so every time, every visit, we re re readdress them. And Haley can attest, she's been there. Would you say they're fairly accepting of the work we do? Yeah, I mean, we had to like change, we had to advance some of the learning because the, especially the kids were like, oh no, we got it. Oh yeah, they, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we really, we, the kids are, are, the kids are the sustenance. I mean, the, the kids are so, they're sponges and they want to learn and, and that's really where 
the change can happen for the generations to come. But even the women, the women just, and again, every project that we do, every teaching that we do is uh, with a, the association Smitty. So they, um, you know, we, we have full communication with them. And, uh, and so if there's negative feedback, we hear about it from them for sure. Yeah. I mean, when, I, when I look at this uh, slide, I remember the uh, slide that you developed when you took my course. Wow. And you presented the slide <laughs> of the compound in Uganda. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. And, you, and the basic point was to ask people what's going on here in right. terms of each one of these different components. By yeah. Looking at that one slide. I yeah. still use that in some of my yeah. classes. Cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I know, if I'd been talking about Uganda, I would have brought that slide up. But <laughs> I should have a better picture of that. Actually, and that, this, when I look at this, I, it looks very tidy to me. I haven't, I, I don't have an inside picture. I do, I just probably need a probably better picture of an inside. But uh, Nutrition and food security, of course, critical. Um, this is a very fertile region. Because of the river running right through there, and they have amazing um, old strategies for irrigation. Um, they have little canals that have been dug, and they use um, flood irrigation for a lot of their plan for, the, for their gardens. Um, and it's been in place for hundreds of years. But they are at high risk for climate change. They're at high risk for infestation of bugs. Uh, they have a lot of potential problems that could come out in the future. And, but they're, in, they're actually a pretty amazing community because they look out for each other. And even the people that don't produce as much or can't produce, they share. Um, they have a communal garden that for people that don't have a garden, they share their, their abundance. Um, so, Compared to when I was working initially in Uganda, it was like, wow, these people are so lucky. They have such great resources for food, and they have water, and they have fertile soil. But it's, it's getting strained, and there's first, you know, the, the climate is changing there. And so uh, one of our projects is um, there is a professor from Montana State University in Bozeman, and he brings agriculture students. Tim Skeeple, Skeeple, and he brings agriculture students and they do soil studies and they look at the crops and so that's one of the ways that we've been working with the local Moroccans to try to help with diversifying and um, you know planning ahead so that if that if, if so that we are one step ahead so and and their typical foods are um, carrots, potatoes, onions, um, corn, wheat, lots of wheat, lots of bread. If you're gluten-free, it's a challenge, but <laughs> it's really good bread. Um, and, and, and they also are very fortunate because they have a, what's called the souk. It's a market, a roving market, and it comes into the village once a week on Mondays, and it's like Christmas every week. I'm sure they get completely bored of the same foods, but you can pretty much get anything you want there. You can get a toothbrush, you can get a new pot, you can get um, all the food you need. There's meats that come in, um, but it costs money, and there are quite a lot of the people, especially out in the, because people live all throughout the hillsides here, and um, they, they, are, they are not wealthy. They cannot afford, so um, it's, Again, they, you know, it's a subs subsistence living for a lot of the people around there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, if, and you can, you can pump this question that we're going to talk about later, but just kind of wondering how you go from um, assessment to identification of need to prioritizing that to enacting that, you know, like, and who does, like, how do you run the trainings and yeah, can we, can I, yeah. Okay, we're getting there. Okay. All right. Um, so water, sanitation, and hygiene. Again, um, 
you don't have clean water, you don't have life. So um, some of the projects that we've undertaken are through the Health Awareness Days um, is a garbage program. Um, so initially started, there was no garbage program. People just burned everything either in their hammams, which are their, or their stoves in the house, um, to throwing it down into the river, to um, burning it in, their, in a tub in their back. So we actually developed a whole garbage program. There's now, the government has taken over the program, which was our ultimate goal. Um, and so there's garbage cans throughout two of the village, three of the four villages. And there's a garbage truck that comes and picks the garbage up and takes it up to an incinerator that the architecture students designed and built in one of the programs a couple years ago. So that's, a, that's an example of one of our sanitation projects. But I want to get to make sure I get to your. Another piece is the education vocational training. Um, there is a tutoring program that was started by Atlas Cultural Foundation that's now in, with the support of the government school. And there's two tutoring programs, one in Agudim and one in Amzerai, the two main villages. And there are about 200 children that attend the tutoring program. It's pre-K through six. It's free. And pretty much all the kids in the region attend that tutoring program, except the ones that live farther out. Um, and I'll, a few years ago, they built a new school, high school, it's a junior high school, um, that actually allows students to board. So for the kids that live way out in the mountains, the parents were, the kids weren't going to school, and the parents actually, and this is where the Moroccan government is pretty amazing because the parents said, we don't, mom said, we don't feel comfortable. Our kids can't get to school safely because they have to cross rivers and in the winter time it's impossible. So they built, the Moroccan government built a big school. And so now there's a boarding school for, the, for girls and boys for the kids that live out of town. So, and we work in that high school as well, um, doing some of the programs. Public health and our health awareness days, this is the health portion. Uh, these are some of the topics that we've covered over the last, um, since 2012 when I got involved. And as I said, we start with one, but every year we revisit hand washing and hygiene. Every year we revisit with the women how to do a self breast exam and what to do if you find something suspicious and you're concerned. And we do not work in the local clinic. Our goal is to support the local clinic because my firm belief is that if you as a medical profession go, professional go into a place and start handing out medications or doing some sort of, you know, chronic disease management that we're undermining the local health system and we have to work with what they have support it and be a resource for professionalism but not undermine it so everything we do is public health related education related and anything that we can't you know if we have any questions if we're any concerned at all we refer them to the clinic um, and we we don't work in the clinic. We don't, yeah, we don't have an affiliate. Well, we have an affiliation with a clinic, but we don't work in the clinic. Who does? There are two nurses that are um, mandated to be there. I can't say, I, I, I wish I could say that the healthcare delivery in that rural clinic was as good as it is in some rural Montana clinics, but it's not. <laughs> um, they've had a real problem with, there's supposed to be a doctor there. Um, and the doctor never shows up, and there's a lot of disgruntlement with the locals about that. Um, the nurses do not speak the local language. The local language is Berber, and so there's some communication gaps there. But um, I'll tell you about this. I just, uh, I just spent a month back in October in Morocco with a group on a Canadian Health Institute research grant, and we're work, that's the piece, that's where I met Hassan. <laughs> and we're working on helping rural clinics connect to the biggest hospitals in the city 
and also have a partnership with uh, McMaster University in, in uh, Canada. And, and so, there, so we have a professional connection going. And with telehealth and all these potentials, it's, you know, the potential is there. It just is going to take some time. Is there a cell phone coverage up there? Yes. It's better than at my house in Canada. I mean, they have 4G and they're, it's really good. Yeah. So... Okay, so I just had to look into a little bit, all right, what is sustainability? What do we mean when we say sustainable? And I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and I was really interested to see that to give support or relief to, which to me, it was like, oh, relief, that sounds like money <laughs> or something. But um, I, I also, of, of or relating to a lifestyle involving the use of sustainable methods. So... Um, it still didn't really answer my question, what is sustainability, but I I, what I feel that it, the Atlas Cultural Foundation is doing, some of the things that we're doing to provide a sustainable relationship, develop sustainable relationships to support a sustainable community includes some of these items on the left. And the number one thing I will say in any work that I've done, you have to have trust. If you don't have trust with the local people, you don't have anything. And this is especially important in Morocco. Well, it's, imp it's important everywhere, but um, if the government doesn't trust you, you are out of there because they will not invite you back. And, and if the local people don't trust you, you are not welcome. You are not going to be asked to go to their homes. You're not going to be asked to participate in any kind of education. You're not going to be asked to go to the schools. So trust is the number one thing. And we've just done that by being there. Um, Chloe and her husband Chris built a place in um, Agudim about uh, eight years ago and they live part-time in Agudim and part-time in France. So they are ingrained in the community there. Um, Chloe and Chris have raised their daughter, Noor, in Agadim. She went to the tutoring school for the first six years of her life. She, um, Chloe speaks fluent Arabic and French and Berber and English. So, um, go ahead. How, uh, how do you navigate trust relationships with the government if you don't think that that government is necessarily doing the right things. Um, I, I guess, well, they, I, 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 I mean, I would say my, my feeling is that they're doing, they're working, we have to work within their structure. Um, and even in our own country, we have to work with our own government. We might not believe with what they're doing all the time, but we have to work within those confines. And, and, and it's the same with Morocco. Um, I think, I get, maybe I'm a Pollyanna and I look at the glass half full, but I think, wow, look at all these great things they're doing for these people here, and this is fantastic. So those are the pieces that I look at, and that's where we work. We work in, in the potentials of, of all the great things that can happen and the great people, and not, I, I, you know, not not focus on the things that can't happen and that won't happen. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so one of the again working with a variety of stakeholders is, um, and I'll get to that here in just a sec. Striving for agility, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, supporting our leaders in the community. And the creation of an, we, we've just recently created Atlas Cultural Foundation Morocco, which is a separate nonprofit run and staffed by local Moroccans. So um, that is the crux to how do we keep this sustainable? If something happens to Chloe or me or some of the other people working, we actually have people on the ground that are taking these projects on. We're mentoring them right now, we're sending them to leadership conferences. 
um, and they're learning the ropes. They already know the ropes pretty well. But uh, if something were to happen, these guys are ready to step in and take over. Are they from the area? Yeah. Or just from? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay, so, so the way Atlas Cultural Foundation um, funds itself, because funding is a huge piece for nonprofits, right? And how do you say stay sustainable and true to yourself and true to your mission, but have money? So Chloe and Chris um, in 2000, I believe it was 2010, started what's called Atlas Cultural Adventures. And like I said, Chris is a rock, he's a climbing guide, he's an ACMG guide. So um, he um, does guiding in Morocco and other parts of the world. Chloe now has Atlas Cultural Adventures, which is the arm which organizes and puts together all the trips for the students from all over the world that are now visiting Zawiya Ahansal. And they visit in all different kinds of capacities, not just with me, but we have arrangements with National Geographic, Rustic Pathways, um, Global Leadership Agency, or um, there's, I think I have quite a few of them listed here, yeah. So these are some of the organizations that we work with, bringing students to Zawiya Ahansal for service learning programs. Or we do vacation volunteer vacations. So um, you can, that's what these gentlemen are doing. They're on a art trip doing paintings of the uh, high Atlas mountains as part of a trip through Atlas Cultural Adventures. All the programs that Atlas Cultural Adventures does supports Atlas Cultural Foundation. So that's where we get some of our money. We also get it from private donors who love the region. And we've had several private donors just donate just to restore an igarum. So an igarum is an ancient granary. And that was on one of the front pictures. I have more pictures of an igarum. And that's, so, so the, what, what I say is that we have some agility. We have some flexibility. We're not, ta we don't, we're not, um, We, if we are not, if, if a donor is not in our, you know, with our mission and in the work that we want to be doing, then that doesn't fit with us and we are okay to say no. And we've, had, we've said no a few times to some pretty big donors, but they had agendas for Atlas Cultural Foundation to get certain things done and we were like, I'm not sure we can do that and I don't think that would be true to our mission, so thank you, but... We're going to have to say no. And um, so far, it's working out OK. How, how many other non-Moroccan NGOs are working in the region? Uh, one. One other? Yeah. And I'm not even sure they're functioning right now. Yeah. Not many. Who is that? It's a woman out of Nelson, BC, actually. And I don't think she even has a name. So, yeah, no, it's a very interesting, like, I'm not sure it's even legal. So, in Zawiya Ahansal, there may be some smaller ones in some of the other, closer to Azilal, but in our region, in the four villages, um, there are no other non Moroccan NGOs. I'm just curious um, if you. If I miss or if you skip by accident the psycho spiritual, the psychosocial and spiritual slide. Oh, good point. Yeah, I was interested in Ah, question. sorry, thank you. Yeah. Um, and this is an igram. So these are, this is one of the igrams that was restored. Um, I can't remember what year that, that this igram was restored, but they're just amazing buildings. And the reason why I use this slide for the psychosocial spiritual is because the community pride is 
the, for, for the local people, this is community pride. They are so proud of their heritage. They're so proud of the region, the beauty of the region, and that's what brings themselves spiritual strength. They're also very highly religious people. And um, so our goal, again, getting back to the question of, you know, how do you work within the con We're non-denominational. We are, we don't um, have any re religious affiliation. We accept people for who they are, where they come from, in whatever spiritual capacity. And this is a piece, um, that I feel is crucial, again, to that sense of community and that lack of, you know, in preventing isolation. That when you get that feeling like, wow, my village is really cool and this is a great place to be, it brings a sense of, of, of community, of pride, and that's the piece that we really focus on um, with the, especially the kids, and getting the kids, they're kids now that want to come back and live in Zawiya Hansal. They used to leave and they would go be gone as fast as they possibly could because there were no jobs. It was not a very happy place to live. And in the last 15 years or so, kids are going off, they're going to university and they're coming back and they're working. And that, I'll get to that. <laughs> One of our employees actually is from Zawiya Hansal. Um, the other employee is married to a guy from Zawiya Hansal. So, um, you know, when I worked in Uganda, this was a very important component because of the war and a lot of those kids had been through horrific things and the families had been through horrific things. And that's why I felt it was really important to add that component. But having, um, do you ever read, anybody read David Brooks? He's a, a New York Times uh, columnist. Anyway, he's got a really new book out that's so interesting and he talks about that same, that spirituality and community and how we need that in in life to be filth fulfilled so that's thank you for reminding me religion? i'm sorry What's the dominant sunni muslim yeah not about 99 percent sunni muslim there are um there's about one there's a handful of jews and some expat americans and canadians and europeans there's quite a few um, obviously a, fr a strong French influence um, and a lot of Spaniards sent come it's quite close so but mostly Muslim yeah the right yes right so they're mostly I mean they they're Berber but they um, are Muslim but if you ask them, they're Berber. <laughs> what exactly is that? Can you explain that? Berber, that... So a Berber is a, it's a, tri it's a tribe. Um, they have been around forever and ever and ever. And they are the original people in that region. So it's, they're tribal. And the nomads that go down to the desert and come back to the mountains, they're Berber. And, but then, um, and I can't remember all the dates because I'm not a very good historian. Maybe you know, Shelley. But um, when, when Morocco was taken over and Muslim became the main religion, then they were sort of adopted into, you know. So they practice, Berber doesn't have its own religion, really. Um, but they're Muslims and they're Berbers. Does that make sense? They were so named because they were supposed to be the barbarians. Right. And that's what the name is, so they don't like the name. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so these are um, the full-time staff members we have for Atlas Cultural Foundation and Atlas Cultural Adventures. So that's one of the other benefits of this hybrid model is that we share staff. So they work about 60% of the time for Atlas Cultural Adventures and about 40% of the time for Atlas Cultural Foundation. But it all kind of meant, melds because they're all together. But they're full-time employees paid with benefits. Um, so the gentleman pouring tea is Ismail, and he uh, is a, has a degree in, in English from the university in Beni Malal. And um, he runs a lot of the student programs, in-country student programs. 
The gentleman on the upper left is um, Ayub. He's been with us the longest. He has a degree in English as well. And the man to the right is the Sheik. Um, he's the Sheik of the region. And he's a good friend of every, I mean, he's just a lovely man. Um, and then the woman down here on the left is, um, or you're right, uh, is Shafia. And Shafia has been with ACF since the, since the beginning, since about 2010. And she has married, she, uh, Shafia and Ayub are from Urzazat, but uh, Shafia married a local school teacher. Uh, a, uh, he, he grew up in Zawiya, went off to get his degree in un university degree, came back and is teaching in the village and they got married. So um, we're very proud of them. They're unbelievably motivated. Um, some of the programs that uh, ACF has supported them in is um, they did a U.S. Embassy leadership training program. They just got back from Germany, um, although Shafia didn't get to go because she's just about to have a baby. So, um, but they went to Germany um, on a program for computer literacy. They have done the English as a second language teaching so they can teach English. Um, they're just incredibly motivated and hardworking and we couldn't do all of this without any of them. And so, uh, and Shafia also is, uh, just started the women's um, empowerment group. Um, and that's where the women's literacy program is, gets involved. So last fall, I was fortunate enough to um, participate in a Canadian Health Institute of Health Research grant. Um, that was a group of folks from McMaster University, University of Texas, um, and a couple universities in, in Morocco. And we, um, the goal is to develop um, a online platform for providers that can access this online platform for information and share information in regards to maternal and infant health in Morocco. And so that is ongoing. But again, it, it's the idea of, um, you know, you work at the local level, you work at the national level, and you work at the international level. And trying to um, have stakeholders and people you're working with it at all those different levels. Um, and this is a, work in progress. So some of the other opportunities we have for Moroccan students, um, now that uh, we have the Atlas Cultural Foundation Morocco allows uh, us to apply for grants that are Moroccan based and we, students from Morocco that live in the city are coming to Zawiya Ahansal and learning about the programs, learning about community, learning about their heritage, learning about gardening, getting their hands dirty because they live in the city, they don't do that, learning where their food comes from. And the programs range anywhere from two days to a week. Um, so, so that's one component of the programs that we do for students. It's not just an international, it's that we're actually building the national program for students even more so right now. This was a, um, uh, a an English um, language program that was through the U.S. Embassy in Rabat. And so they spent time in Rabat and then they came to Zawiya Ahansal and spent some days in Zawiya Ahansal. Now, the other thing is the um, opportunities for the international students, and this is where my work comes in as well, um, is that I do a service learning program through the University of Montana in Billings. And we bring, I have uh, a variety of students from nursing, pre-med, health administration, public health, um, all different, as lots of different kinds of students that um, go every year, we go in May. And I've been doing this since 2012. So you get to um, dig in the garden. This is our community garden. You get to dig in the garden with a sheik. Um, 
And usually the programs last anywhere between four and six weeks. Um, it's, we, there's architecture, French students, health students. I guess that's probably the main. You get to experience Moroccan hospitality. The food in Morocco is really good. It's all lots of vegetables and the tagines and the spices and um, it's just delicious. So this is the sheik's wife, Leila Aisha, and the students often stay with the sheik. So uh, they get to know the sheik's family and learn how to cook and it's a, it's a, it's a full experience. We, um, we do all kind of the community engagement activities. So these are the health awareness days. It's um, working in the tutoring program. So we'll go to the tutoring program and teach about sugar and brushing your teeth. And um, interestingly, Morocco is experiencing a little bit of what we call the epidemiological U-turn. I don't know if you've heard this term, but I love it. Basically, we're going from communicable diseases to non-communicable chronic diseases. So it used to be, you know, we worried about waterborne illnesses, and now we're worried about diabetes. So we need to be agile in that, and we need to be recognizing that, wow, we've got to start with these kids and, and like, start working and teaching about sugar and processed foods because they're getting all this processed foods now that they've got a road and a souk and everything is coming in with it. And, and again, who are we to say, we drink Coke and we like our cookies and, you know, it's easy for us to say, oh no, you shouldn't eat any of that. But in reality, you know, like, hey, learn from our mistakes and please <laughs> think when you uh, open up that pop, that can of pop. Uh, the other thing we do with the students is we always go on a mountain trek. You get to go up into the mountains for a couple of days, see how life is like up in the mountains, because it's different. Where we are is rural. It's five to six hours from Marrakesh by car. But that's the big city. The, the, the villages where we live and stay are the big city. And then when we walk into the mountains, it's anywhere between a day walk, five hours to a day. And life is very different up there. And you really get to see how hard life can be. So um, I think it's important to see that because it, then you get a sense of like, oh, wow, if I got hurt up here, what would happen? If I'm having a baby and I can't get to a, and the clinic is a five hour walk, what am I really looking at? So um, we, spend time, even though it's fun and it's beautiful, it's also an educational piece there too. So that was uh, one of our students from the French program a couple years ago and they just love it. They were, she was having a great time. And uh, we've been doing it now for 11 years, uh, bringing students to Morocco and working in so we are Hansal. And the one thing, the other piece I'll share is that um, Northern Africa doesn't have the greatest reputation in America. And, you know, I think we get these stereotypes and these stigmas that, oh, this is the way that every, everybody is, or isn't that dangerous? Aren't you afraid to go there? And when, you, when, when we bring the students, and they come home and they are absolutely thrilled and they've had the most incredible experience. They've met these wonderful people. They've just learned a whole new culture. They tell their family and then their family, you know, they share it with their family. And that's how we bring this Montana connection, this Morocco-Montana connection together because it's, um, it, you know, you can think that it's so different on the other side of the world, but really it's not. And, it, and, and the people are lovely and they're wonderful. And it's so important to make sure that we share, you know, that that, that information is shared. So that's the other thing that I feel is great about bringing the students. 
And I did want to point, touch on the whole idea of, you know, one of the pieces that I'm doing in, in some of my work is looking at healthcare delivery in rural settings. And when you look, you know, as I was saying, is like if you're five hour walk and you are having a baby, how do we manage that? And it's not that different in Montana. I know it's not, uh, we have helicopters here. They actually have helicopters in Morocco. We flew a lady out a couple years ago that was having a dangerous uh, birth. So it can happen, but um, it's, there are so many similarities that we can look at. And I think that's, again, getting back to the glass half full. It's like, let's look at these similarities. Let's see where we can learn from each other and, and make the world a little smaller. So I think that's all I have. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the health stuff. Are there government incentives? Like, are they sending people away to medical school and then bringing them back? You know, I mean, if they're taking the care of people, are they trying to bring in their health care from international areas? Um, they are. It's. Uh, they, they actually have a mandatory, they're trying to institute a mandatory rural requirement. Kind, not that different from the Montana Rural Medicine Program, where if you go and work in a rural area for two years, you get your tuition paid for. Um, they've actually implemented something kind of like that in Morocco. Um, and it, I do know that there are some clinics in other rural parts of Morocco where it is, it's worked. Um, but again, there's the, the big thing is the cultural and the language barrier. And a lot of those students are coming, or you know, medical students or new physicians or new nurses, they're coming from Rabat or from the big city. And it's, there is a bit of distrust between the local people and the doctor coming from the big city. But I mean, it's not that much different in certain places where I've worked in rural areas. You know, there, is, there can be some distrust. And that's again where we just work to build, on, build that trust. So. I was curious because you said that the King has really invested in these social programs sort of mm -hmm. in hopes to, to quell distrust or mm -hmm. unrest. And I was wondering if you are actively involved with their government, if there's a future plan projecting that decrease in infant mortality rate and having a bigger population growth and how it mitigates that, like where those people are going to end up in 50 years. Do you know if there's an active like, structural idea? So say that again. So if you're investing in, in health care right. uh, in these rural areas, then you're right. going to see most likely a, a decrease in infant mortality rate, a decrease in maternal death rates, which okay. is great. That means an increase in population. Okay, Maybe yeah. Not. So is there like some... What's the plan? Yeah, does he have a plan? <laughs> um, I don't know, does any country have a plan? Do we have a plan here in the United States? Um, I, I think, I mean, if, you know, I, I think one of the things is that there is this huge potential in the rural area. And yes, they, you know, people, I mean, there's a, there's, the cities are going to get bitter, bigger, there's no doubt about it. But I think if, if you know, one piece that, that has potential is to have, not in, ha, instead of the brain drain and everybody leaving to go to, to go to the bigger city or to go to another country, is to try to bring people back to the local area, to Im improve the education level, which by improving the education level, you're hopefully decreasing the number of babies that everybody's having. I mean, I think that's their ultimate goal. But um, it's a, you know, that's a, that's a challenging, that's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in the work that you've been doing, the public health work, uh, have you been exposed to people with disabilities? I'm curious oh, good to question. know what yeah. um, In Morocco, um, yes, a little bit. And they have a very open mind about the whole thing. It's, he's part, they're part of the family. There's no shame in it. Um, they, the resources are 
family strength. Um, I wouldn't say there's a plethora of resources for people with disabilities, unfortunately. Um, but at the same time, they're not shunned. I have, in Uganda, it was horrible um, because, you know, we had one, one family member who had hydrocephalus and, and literally lived in a hut that was, he never went outside. Yeah, so you probably experienced this. And it's horrible. And that is another piece about the, you know, what I found when I went to Morocco. I was like, wow, this is great. Oman, do you remember Oman? Anyway, there's several kids in the, in the village with disabilities and they are absolutely included in all of the festivities. They're always around, they're not, they're in school with whatever school they can, you know, with the school that they can do. It's, they're embracing, they're not, I know. Yeah, it's very refreshing, yeah. Could you say something about uh, experiences with infectious diseases uh, in the communities that you've worked in in Morocco there? Yeah. So I would say the biggest dilemma they had when I, especially when I first got there, was um, infectious diarrhea. Their water source was horrible. It was E. coli, most likely in the water. Um, the, every, every year in the dry season, the whole village would get sick, including us. <laughs> and um, in the time that I've been there, they have hired, they've developed a water association. And they were just getting water from the river or from a spring where the animals were drinking out of. I have a great picture, I didn't put it in, but there's all these donkeys and there's the lady filling up her water jug, you know. And, um, since then, they've developed a water association. They have gotten funding from the Moroccan government and they put in a water chateau, they call it. So it pumps water out of the Hansal River up to a chateau, then it gets treated. They send water samples to the um, main office in Azilal, I think once or twice a month, and then it's chlorinated. So it's basically fully treated water. The number of illnesses from water, from water illnesses, skin rashes, um, it is dramatically decreased. Um, I don't know statistics because we have a very difficult time gathering statistics, but um, just all you'd have to do is look at the people and talk to the people. It's very qualitative data collection, um, but it's um, remarkable how much healthier everybody looks. And yeah. Yeah. About things like tuberculosis or HIV, do you run into? I would say um, they I, again. I don't know statistics. I know there are there are instances of it. I would say the next biggest concern that we have is STDs, because what's happening? What happens is now that the road is in, the men go out to the big city, and then they come back and they bring STDs with them. And this is becoming a really big problem. And especially because some of the STDs are becoming resistant to a lot of the antibiotics. So um, we have been asked um, to, to do some education on it in the past. Um, we are, it was, a, it was not a formal written document, please teach and do some STD education. So we're waiting for that. Uh, it has to be a little more organic. I'm not gonna go in there and start teaching um, STD yes. prevention. They do it at the clinic, yeah. And again, if anybody comes to us, like if we learn of anything, and right now we're in the midst of developing a community health worker program, so we're actually training uh, some of the women and men to recognize and and, and if signs and symptoms of certain things, we have different topics and um, they are instructed to refer them to the clinic if they have any concern about that. Yeah, yep, yeah, no, it's a big problem. Okay, Haley. You have done so many programs with ACF um, and you and Chloe and all the various partners. Um, what program would you say was the most surprising in that it either just took off and you had no idea it would be so successful or you thought it was just going to absolutely take off and it turned out it wasn't a good fit for the community? 
I'm going to tell you the menstruation program. Yeah. So last year when Haley came, we got to do, um, we have been asked to do an education on um, menstruation and hygiene in the, in the government school, in the boarding school. Because the, the, the girls and the boys that live, that live at the boarding school are from way out in the mountains. Um, they are very shy and there's been a lot of research around menstruation and girls not going to school because of their period. And so we were asked by the local association, Smitty, to go into the school system and do some teaching on this. And Haley got to do this as part of her practicum for her master's in public health here. And so we worked with an organization called Days for Girls um, that's based out of Bellingham, Washington, that um, make uh, maxi pads because girls can't afford maxi pads over there. They're very expensive. And so we uh, are now, it, it's, it's only been a year because we did the first one last year and already I'm bringing back another 250 maxi pads or something like that. Um, these, so they're sewn, um, it, it's a special liner that is um, then can be interchanged with a pad and it's a whole teaching about the hygiene and the importance of um, hygiene and going to sc and then going to school and so it's been a huge success and I'm very excited about it. I mean we've done a lot of the hardest program in country, the garbage program was the hardest program we've ever done because again that whole concept of getting people to go from throwing their garbage down here to in a in a pin in a bin was very very challenging and still is challenging. I mean it's it's going on. But no, the, hydra the, the menstruation, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that you recognized Haley because uh, Haley is here and she uh, would be happy to talk to anyone who would be interested in what her experience was like uh, in, in Morocco working on menstrual health. And also, the other thing that's interesting here is that we had a lecture last year, I believe, uh, by a representative from Days for Girls, which is now up on our website. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Sarah Webb was, uh, Jenny was a, the first speaker in January last year, and she was fabulous, actually. So yeah, that's great. So that's where we found out about Days for Girls. Yeah, Small World Connections. And they actually actively recruit volunteers to sew these. Oh, yeah. I bet there. I bet there's a Missoula. I would bet there's a Missoula chapter. Yeah, you need to start a chapter. Yeah, Because there's, I mean, there's like three in Spokane. They're all over the place. So that would be really cool. And and so now what we're doing is we're teaching the women how to sew the pads themselves. So that's our goal this year. We're bringing, we're bringing some fabric. And we've just hired a sewing teacher as part of the women's empowerment group, and now they're going to be sewing the pads themselves. Yeah, so that's pretty fun. So I, I, I want to answer <laughs> one quick question. I know Alexandra has a question too. So Mike, at the end of your talk, you said that uh, one of the things that's so important is learning from each other. So what would you say? Give us some specifics. What did you learn from your time in Morocco that you've been able to bring back? Uh -huh. uh, in, your, in your work here, yeah. besides the lectures. <laughs> um, I would say the biggest thing that I've learned is a humbleness um, and being humble in a culture that I knew nothing about and um, being, uh, learning, learning about their culture, learning, becoming friends with these people, and learning about myself, um, and any, you know, again, these, you have these preconceived ideas of what, you know, I don't know anything about people from Northern Africa. I really didn't know a lot about uh, Morocco the first time I went and and the first time after coming back I just remember feeling very humbled and very um, honored that they allowed me to be in their life 
that they accepted me in their community and in their lives. And I'm very grateful for that. And um, so, is that? Yeah, that's great. So, one last question. What's the impact of online access if they've got 4G? Yeah. Somebody must have been thought it was worth investing in cell towers. So, yeah. there must be enough of an uh, audience part. Um, yeah. Well, I'm. Leap over because they have. I'm sorry? What will they be able to leap over because they have? Them? Yeah. Well, they're definitely going to leap over phone lines. <laughs> Um, and, and in a lot of ways, I hope they leap over some of our ancient medical technology and can actually move to a better t medical technology. Um, what's that? Not yet, but that actually is one of our goals for that uh, CIHR grant, is to uh, begin trying to do some telehealth. That's one of the components that they really want to do. Um, but the one downside of that is that there is a lot of bad stuff out there on the internet and so that's been one of our great concerns is just the kids are getting their hands on smartphones and um, and they're seeing things on the internet that they've never seen anywhere else and and unfortunately this is how they're learning about sexuality and it's a big problem and it's not just a big problem in rural Morocco, it's a big problem all over the place. And again, and, and so the German group that's from Germany that have been working, that's their niche. And they're trying to do some education and that's why these, one of the reasons why those guys were just in Germany was to learn a little bit about proper and, you know, how do we use the internet so it's a good thing and not a bad thing. But that's a really good question because it's a double-edged sword, yeah. And they have a road, yep, yeah, the road. Uh, it, in 2000, so the road, was, the road was very rough, and half the time it was closed in 2012, and then they finished paving it in 2015. So in four years they've gone from physical Oh, yeah. And refrigerators and... Um, satellite dishes, you know, their favorite thing for the women to do now is watch Turkish soap operas. <laughs> yeah, and... On that note, <laughs> uh, before I uh, thank um, Lee for her talk tonight, I just want to make an announcement about next week. Uh, so next week we have Jonah Atterbury coming from... Uh, I believe it's New Mexico, is that right? Uh, he's in Nebraska. Nebraska. He's coming from Nebraska, and he's going to talk about the head and the heart. What global health research has to teach us about health care in Montana. Uh, this would be a really good way to uh, end up the lecture series, I think. And then immediately after Jonah's lecture next week, we're going to have a reception. We call it the celebration event where we invite all of you, people from the community, students, especially students who are graduating with the minor in global public health, and all of the lecturers who can make it, and the faculty and so forth, to come together and kind of interact for about an hour. Probably try to make that start around 7.30 next week, and uh, we'll go to the president's room in Brantley Hall for that reception. So put that on your calendar, and please join us next uh, next week for that reception as well. So this has been great. Uh, it's wonderful to see um, how someone from our Master of Public Health program has gone on to do so many wonderful things around the world uh, and even inspired uh, Haley to go along with her at one, at one point in time. Uh, so, and thank you for coming well, back, Lee, yeah, and sharing all of this with us. Thank you. And if anybody wants to meet with her one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sure she'll yeah. be willing to do that. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah.